I cannot decide which I like less. The swamps or the city. Both are full of parasites, reptiles, and slime. We're a long way each to land we know, and far from real open country. It's honestly a little crazy to think that almost six years after this game released, only now am I finally truly appreciating how amazing of an addition Arthur's Journal was to Red Dead Redemption 2. I mean, don't get me wrong, this isn't exactly exclusive to just this game. Many stories can be told, and every emotion we as people experience can all be captured and conveyed through modern media. Video games, the most popular, or at least most rapidly growing form of media, is no exception to that. I would actually go so far as to claim video games, given the countless hours we can explore the world in almost complete freedom in exploring this game's universe. A universe that has taken a development team stacked with talented writers, animators, artists, and voice actors, all coming together to allow us to enjoy this masterpiece that has taken years of their blood, sweat, and tireless work to come to fruition. Sure, television shows and movies can help us visualize something, sometimes better for some, as we're actually witnessing real people go through whatever it is that they're currently faced with versus something that's just animated. But the world and the story presented in that form is told to us, and we only get to see an eye-catching prop or set piece for 10 to 30 seconds. We're not allowed to actually enjoy and appreciate every small detail of a prop designer's work, of an artist's work, something that took 20, 30, sometimes 100 plus hours to create, we've only seen for 10 to 20 seconds very briefly. And we're at the mercy of the story that's very perfectly controlled and deliberately fed to us in a specific way. Now I'm not saying that is a bad thing, but versus a video game where the story is interactive when we can dive headfirst into the furthest, least well-known areas of the map, slowly taking our time to digest each and every small detail by contrast. In this way, it allows us as the player to better understand the world we're dropped in and the character's situation that we're playing as. Just how grave or dangerous what they may be facing. Games have evolved massively and it goes without saying there are many different games with varying degrees of depth and intention with their storytelling. From questions of morality, a story of redemption, a mistake out of fear, an unexplored love interest or being a one-man army fighting an opposing faction. Some games are much more grounded and serious while others are more whimsical and lighthearted. Is, you're a total bitch. Games like The Last of Us have that emotional push and pull placed directly in front of us. The connection and the relationship between Joel and Ellie is what essentially solidified that as one of the most narratively compelling stories. Others place gameplay as a priority, with lore and depth provided in audio logs, newspaper clippings, or any other form of environmental storytelling for those that are hungrier for the story that lies underneath the surface. I'm sure there's many games like that, but primarily a game that comes to mind here would be Doom. It's all about killing first, and if you want to know exactly how shit hit the fan, you're more than welcome to find tablets and other things out in the world. Or even Borderlands, for instance. It's lighthearted, funny, and colorful on the surface, but when you dive into that game's lore, it's actually the complete opposite. It's very dark. There's a lot of cannibalism. Millions of people dying due to corporate greed. People being completely abandoned and just stranded on planets that aren't even habitable to begin with. And I just wanted to start this video off by highlighting various games and various methods because while I do want to highlight Arthur's Journal and we're going to discuss it a little bit more here as a valuable resource of storytelling and character development, Red Dead Redemption 2 is not the only game to do that. I think praising it and claiming it's the only game to ever have something like that would be incredibly naive and a disservice to many other games out there. But for me personally, why I value his journal so much and why it's one of the driving reasons behind replaying the game and its entirety trying to 100% it. Mind you, I've beaten this game well over a dozen times now, with almost 3,000 hours clocked in since the day it released across two different platforms, all of which strictly in single player. And that's because it ties into Arthur. And yet, despite all this time, years and countless of hours later, I still have this intense drive to 100% the game again because of this small thing. It ties into Arthur, his character, and all the unique ways in which his story is told. His journey and even our decisions 
changed and that dictates what exactly he documents and writes down we get a very unique look into duchess fall from grace in arthur's eyes the morning he goes through when a character dies off or on screen and every major plot twist pretty much anything you can think of can be and will be found within the confines of this book there's plenty of other games out there that allows us to collect tons of audio logs and tapes covering the world multiple planets, important characters and their deepest secrets and most latent fears, all of which can be found and collected at our own leisure. Other games are much more flexible and in-depth in terms of player choices, how that impacts their overall story, how other characters view the main character, and what I would say is probably the most important thing, the individual unique player experiences, the stuff we take away based off the story we were told, which is determined by our own individual choices. By contrast, Arthur's journal is nowhere near as flexible. On the one hand, it's another way to convey more lore and information like those other pieces, but the journal is significant because of how it's implemented, how it's updated, not just along the main story, but the strangers and locations you can find out in the open world. Arthur writing this stuff down makes this universe feel so much more fleshed out, jotting down his thoughts on individual strangers and locations that piques his interest. Some of these things you would never even give a second thought, and I wanted to provide a few examples, one of which is tied to the story. I'm a mess. Well, you ain't dead. There is that. Jimmy Brooks. Jimmy Brooks is a character you come across fairly early on in the game. He's about on screen for a solid minute or two during only one mission, and you'll never see or hear from him ever again. For some, you may never even see this interaction between Arthur and Brooks because you can opt to just let him fall to his death, immediately killing him making him so insignificant you won't ever hear his name. Arthur seemingly forgets about him as quickly as many people do, which is fair. Why would you even remember him? You only have this small interaction with him and then you go about your business, continuing to explore the vast world that, might I add, was just opened up to you. Finally, after hours of being stuck in the mountains, you're dying to explore this world just as much as Arthur was dying to get off that mountaintop. He's a brief thought, very small, but apparently it's significant enough for Arthur to document it in his journal, which in the grand scheme of things is probably the appropriate action to do because the weight of Arthur being recognized in Valentine months after disappearing into the mountains and showing up in an entirely different state after being on the run for so long and he's still able to be recognized, it demonstrates how serious the Blackwater Massacre really was and highlights Arthur's fears of hanging around the city for far too long. Being afraid of arousing suspicion or him or other gang members being easily recognizable by someone, which just happened. Weren't you in Blackwater a few weeks back? Me? No, sir. Ain't from there. Oh, you were. Well, I definitely saw you with a bunch of fellers. And that is a fear of Arthur's that's only expressly mentioned in his journal. I want to move on to a few other examples, but one last mention of Jimmy Brooks is there's not only different entries on whether if you kill him or not, if you choose to let him live, Arthur shares his fears on the possibility of letting him coming back to haunt them, versus if you kill him, Arthur coldly states he can't take any chances. There's newfound depth to an otherwise small situation. By him being merciful, even though we forget and he never really plays a part in the story, it does go to show that Arthur's still considerate of any ramifications of what he does or doesn't do, which shows that there's more depth to him than, than him just being the blockhead that so many people refer to him as. As the story progresses, we start seeing the depth and the multiple layers that is within him because of the immediate dangerous changes that are going on to his personal health and everyone else around him. But if you immediately dive headfirst into the journal, you can start seeing those deeper layers as soon as chapter two. Or let's switch it up and talk about more significant characters. In the interactions between Hosea and Arthur, you can see the respect and love Arthur has for Hosea. You can tell that even though he loves and respects Dutch, even if it's a little different on account of Dutch and Hosea's different approach to problem solving, it's still there. And while he, just like everyone else, praises Dutch for everything that he's done for them, there's a quiet sense of submission just sitting in Hosea's presence and soaking in everything he has to say, which could leave you wondering who Arthur really loved more. Who would he listen to and back up when push came to shove? Was it Dutch or did Hosea really have a little more influence over him? If it even mattered, it could have always boiled down to an equal love and respect that children have for both their parents, but 
In Arthur's journal, he expresses he actually loves Hosea more in many different ways and even goes to add a description to it, sharing Hosea is kind and fair like a human being. Statements like that provide a new light on Hosea and Arthur's relationship, Hosea's form of leadership, and potentially how most of, if not a handful of people, view the differing ways of Dutch and Hosea. In previous videos, I mentioned how Arthur reflects on his moment with the German family, the role Charles plays in making Arthur reflect on why he is so hesitant to help people or do the right thing. Get the hell out of they here! They took off Aza. Who did? Men, last night. Where? Where did they take him? Ain't no business of ours. I don't even speak their language. You ain't as tough and dense as all that. We've also pointed out how after the trolley station set up by Angelo Bronte, Dutch has a vendetta against him. That's apparent through cutscenes. Need to take revenge, we hardly know the guy. This ain't about revenge, Hosea. Angelo Bronte don't mean shit to me. Arthur unveils just how unhinged Dutch is in his journal, though. The sheer mention of Bronte's name was enough to make Dutch explode. And he exploded to the point even Micah stood clear of Bronte's name, refusing, in Arthur's words, to touch it with a 10-foot pole. He shares his thoughts on Jim Boy Calloway and his former running mates, the woman searching for dinosaur fossils, and possibly my most favorite entry of them all, his admission to feeling nothing at finally seeing the gang's longtime rival, Como Driscoll, swing at the gallows giving more depth to the ultimate question of what was really all Dutch's own design. Was the gang a group of romanticized idealists the way they had imagined themselves to be this entire time? Or was Dutch and the love everyone who followed him so powerful they were never able to see clearly for themselves? I encourage you to delve deeper into Arthur's journal if you're a fan of this game's story, the world, and never fail to be touched by Arthur's journey. And for the rest of you that have taken the time to watch this video, I encourage you to take an extra second and really explore the world and extra bits of lore the developers take care in adding into these games. Games like The Last of Us and Red Dead Redemption can be carried by the solid voice acting and motion capture. That's more than enough to tug at the heartstrings and give us a hell of a good story, but it's what lies beneath that really makes the games feel like its own universe. I just wanted to take this time to say thank you if you stood all the way to the end, or even for taking the time to watch just a fraction of this video. I was working on a massive breakdown, or entire reading of Arthur's journal rather, after it being 100%ed, and it was while making that video that I started to appreciate this valuable piece of information much more. And I didn't want to make this video just highlight specifically the journal, but to just show a little more appreciation for all the hard work that developers really put into these games. I know we give developers like Ubisoft a lot of shit for bloating the crap out of their games, but you still gotta appreciate the amount of work going into actually making the worlds feel somewhat genuine by the lore and additional information added to it. Anyways, thank you so much for watching. Please consider hitting the subscribe button if you are brand new to the channel. And like usual, I have a few more Red Dead videos set to go out this month and we can keep branching out to other topics and other videos and I'm always open to suggestions and recommendations on what you want me to cover but until then, see you on the next video.